Hello everyone, Lorne Master of SoTech here, and I'm just realizing that we're talking about a blog today, so I don't actually need my headphones on. But today we've got more exciting news from Creative Assembly, that of course being the Elspeth Von Draken blog, which is going to be showing us all of the Empire aspects of the DLC, as well as all the free LC reworks that are coming for the Empire. Nurgle made out pretty damn well, I would say from uh, his article last week alongside Tarmacon. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into what the greatest death wizard of the empire has to offer. So we have this week, we're back with our second deep dive into Thrones of Decay. Having royally infested ourselves with Nurgle's blessing last time, we feel it appropriate to take a refreshing trip to the gardens of Moor. Um, also, they are noting that uh, the 30th, of April. oh there's like some thing here but the, the release date is going to be the 30th of april so they're they're confirming the release date which is awesome i don't know why the tech got like a little corrupted there but um on y'all's version it should be all fixed but uh yep yeah, so april is going to be the release date uh they are technically making their uh promise of getting, <laughs> getting it out in april as they like to do right at the buzzer but hey it counts so without further ado uh with that out of the way very exciting. End of the month is going to be super cool. Let's jump into it. So we have Elspeth von Draken. So we have the Dark Lady of Nuln, also known as the Graveyard Rose. She's the respected advisor to the Elector Countess Emmanuel von Liebwitz, which they spelled wrong, but that's okay. At a and I love her design. Even though those roses, uh, as Andy Law is very fond of pointing out, those roses should actually be black, not purple or pink. Uh, I think they made them a brighter color to help them stand out more, but they should actually be just full on black because they're the black roses of more, but whatever. At a glance, here's what she brings to the Empire. She's, of course, a spellcaster, a potent lore of death spellcaster with a hefty scythe to booth. Uh, boot, she has a healthy mix of subversion and magic. Mounts, she could utilize a warhorse, but also the monstrous Carmine Dragon. She has the Imperial Gunnery School, which is her unique campaign mechanic. Focus on developing the stages of the Empire's weaponry with uh, mixing black powder and wizardry. And then the Gardens of Moor, which is a building type that allows Elspeth to transport her armies instantly to uh, other Gardens of Moor. Descended from a bloodline long touched by the winds of magic, Elspeth has been often been a reclusive yet baneful foe to the enemies of the Empire. As an ex obsessive experimenter and master of magic, it's time to bring her power to the forefront and enhance the Empire's forces in the face of emerging chaos. Often found mounted atop a Carmine Dragon, Elspeth von Dragon is deadly in every sense of the word. The two-handed Pale Scythe, her weapon of choice, passively grants her increased spell mastery and spell resistance, growing in intensity as she casts further spells. I don't know if that's... I assume that means spell resistance because they said spell mastery and resistance. And with the De Death's Timekeeper, she can reverse the sands in her favor, healing her own wounds by siphoning life from an enemy via direct damage. That's always super amazing. So she kind of has like a secondary built-in spirit leech thanks to her hourglass item, but not only does it deal a lot of direct damage to whoever she targets, it also heals her a pretty chunk of health, which is super duper nice. As she stands somewhere between life and death, we must also look at Dark Walker, an active augment that grants Elspeth a large helping of physical resistance and triggers the Strider attribute. When she's mounted on the Carmine Dragon, a uh, coruscating blast can be used. This is an active dragon breath attack that delivers magical and flaming damage. Plus, with the Living Darkness passive, she increases her own physical resistance further whilst completely removing magical attacks from enemies within her area of effect. So that's amazing, right? That's super strong. Anytime you can remove magical attacks from enemies, that basically means your physical resistance is now a ward save instead of just physical resist. So that's an amazing ability. I do like that it's not too overpowered and that it's just an area of effect around her. So if you have magical shooting attacks or you're launching spells at her and stuff, she is still, you know, relatively vulnerable to those. Um, she isn't able to just completely negate the effects of magical attacks. It has to be something nearby. But that means that she's going to be relatively tanky for a wizard character. <clears throat> All right, the Imperial Gunnery School. The Empire's arsenal needs an upgrade fast, and the long-standing institution of great knowledge and innovation, the Imperial Gunnery School, has the means to make that a reality. Elspeth von Dragon's unique faction mechanic, the Imperial Gunnery School, offers permanent upgrades for gunnery and artillery units in return for schematics, a resource earned from using gunnery units in battle, as well as from special post-battle options when defeating enemy gunpowder units. 
Some Imperial Gunnery School upgrades are available from the very start, but innovation is nothing without the knowledge to back it up, and thus the more advanced upgrades require the Gunnery School itself to advance. The Imperial Gunnery School can be advanced via field testing, a series of challenges and prerequisites that prove the institution has what it takes. Once enough progress has been made, the Amethyst Armory can be unlocked. Here is where further schematics can be spent on exclusive Amethyst units and powerful, restockable, single-use abilities. So this is very, very awesome. You can tell there's definitely some strong similarities between the Imperial Gunnery School and Ikit Claw's Clan Scryer Workshop. Um, I, I definitely think there's there's uh, some inspiration there, but I think it's a very nice use of the mechanic. But you can see here that you're able to get upgrades for you've got like gun infantry, mounted uh, mounted black powder units, mortars, cannons, uh, Hellblaster volley guns, Hellstorm rocket batteries, steam tanks, and Marienburg land ships, uh, which is very very sexy. Uh, I think this is going to be super great, especially for a lot of the way people. Folks like to traditionally play the empire you know generally speaking i would say the empire is pretty famous for just going crazy on the black powder you know going really heavy into all the war machines and all the black powder units um that is traditionally i think a way a lot of people really prefer to play the faction so elspeth von draken leaning into that heavily because she's the Nolan representative i think is going to work really really well it's quite interesting that um I think a lot of people, myself included, were probably expecting Elspeth to be more like, oh, this is going to be kind of a magical focus character. So maybe she's going to come with like the Celestial Hurricanum and the Wizard Lords and stuff like that. But that's not really what her gimmick is because they're leaning much heavier into how she's represented within the Tarmacon book, which is that she is a force within the city of Gnome. She is a Gnome themed character, which means despite the fact that she is a death wizard riding a dragon, Ultimately, engineering and black powder are kind of the main focuses of what comes with her, uh, which we'll see. So then we have the Gardens of Moor mechanic. For the deceased to receive protection from Moor, the god of the dead, after they pass over to the afterlife, they must be buried in the Gardens of Moor, where black roses grow and magic has no place. For to allow it would defy the certainty of one's demise. With the Gardens of Moor, Elspeth von Draken erects new black tower buildings in any friendly, vis uh, visible friendly or neutral empire settlement and reaps powerful benefits. Once constructed, Elspeth's army can travel instantly to any selected Gardens of Moor via fast travel, which has both a cost and a cooldown period. These sacred gardens also offer the construction of powerful buildings that can push back corruption, allow for recruitment in foreign territory, and much more. The gardens themselves are limited in number, and if a settlement containing one is raised or occupied by a hostile and or non-Empire faction, the gardens within are burned. So you can see here that you have a limit of five gardens of more that you can have anywhere uh, within the Empire, which is pretty cool, uh, or Empire territory. And when you build them up, you can see here they've got the little fast travel button that they're moused over, which does have a cooldown, but it allows you to fast travel Elspeth and only Elspeth. Uh, so you can't fast travel any of your other armies, just the one that she is personally leading, which kind of helps her very much stand out and make it that, it, you know, clearly it's a power based around her, um, not her faction, which is uh, nice. I like, it, it makes it so that it's not too overpowered and makes it a very unique gimmick to that character as opposed to being like, oh, the Empire has unlocked fast travel, which isn't really something they should have because uh, that's not something they would really lean, in, lean into uh, where it would be much more appropriate for some other factions. Theodore Bruckner. Often, oh God, he's such a big man. Look how big he is next to these dudes. Often known as the Hand of Judgment, Theodore Bruckner, a legendary hero, serves as the headsman and judicial champion to the Electric Countess of Nuln. He stands with the Empire as not just the Hand of Justice among them, but also as a mighty foe to any political opponents that stand against the ways of the Countess. Famed as a savage, skilled fighter with inhuman abilities, Theodore Bruckner has felled many a powerful opponent and has set his sights on Tarmacon. Giant in stature and with an optional demigriff mount for extra mobility, Bruckner is the ideal right-hand man in any conflict. With the Hand of Judgment passive augment triggering when in range of an enemy character, Bruckner becomes unbreakable and gains the execute behavior to strike them down quickly. Which for those that don't know execute, um... Execute is basically that if the enemy gets below a certain uh, health threshold, uh, you can just kill them. Um, it's a very small uh, percentage. I think it's like 5 or 5%, something like that. 
but uh, it allows you to execute. Uh, you on bow has access to this ability. It's very, very nasty. As the Titan Headsman, this active hex effect can decrease the movement speed and melee defense of enemies while the fearsome combatant passive hits the opposition with an intimidating aura, dropping their leadership. So obviously he sounds like an absolute beat stick and badass, which is great. The Empire, the Empire definitely needed a legendary hero whose goal is just to just punch people in the face so hard that they're just, you know, they're broken. Uh, he may also uncover the Liar's Bane and Stormlance weapons, as well as possessing the deadly Bale Flame Amulet. This amulet triggers a large explosion when the wearer meets their demise, dealing high damage to those in range. He's going down swinging. So, uh, clearly, he's one of those really interesting characters where he kind of has a built-in system of you get your maximum effect from him if he dies, uh, which is interesting because he's going to deal like a ton of damage to those around him. As with the story about Bruckner, uh, ultimately him dying is what leads to the death of Tarmacon because he kills Tarmacon's ogre body, which was kind of falling apart by that point. And when Tarmacon's maggot form jumps out and starts eating its way into Bruckner, because Bruckner didn't know that was going to happen. And he, by that point, he was so exhausted, he couldn't defend himself from Tarmacon's true form. And Tarmacon kills him. Like Tarmacon just eats his way into Bruckner. But he doesn't know that Elspeth von Draken knows the truth of Tarmacon. She knows how he works. She knows his gimmick. So she gave Bruckner the Bale Flame Amulet, not really telling what it does, if memory serves. And so when he dies, the Bale Flame Amulet activates and it just obliterates his body in pretty much a nuclear explosion of death magic. Like it's, it's like a purple sun on cocaine just goes off in that moment. And because Tarmacon is literally on slash in him, there's nowhere to hide. And Tarmacon just gets absolutely obliterated, just turned into like purple ash. So awesome. Uh, I love that he's got the item. Uh, I do like that he has unbreakable when he's nearby enemy characters, because you're definitely going to want him to be unbreakable so that he fights to the bitter end and he dies when fighting an enemy character. So hopefully he can do a lot of damage. The master engineer. So yeah, no wizard lord. Um, I don't, I think there's a, a very good chance we're going to see at least one more DLC for the Empire. Um, I'm hoping for at least one more big DLC for the Empire themed around, uh, Mindenheim, but, uh, where we'll hopefully see like Wizard Lords and Grand Masters, but, uh, Wizard Lord to me definitely feels like one of those things that'll probably be a free LC inclusion, but, uh, cause all, pretty much all of the Wizards have been FLC updates, but, uh, let's see what we got here. So we have the Master Engineer with a big old fat gun. The sight of a Master Engineer is a rare one within the Empire. These quiet men of intellect and progress learn to write scripture, design outlandish architecture, and invent strange machinery for the benefit of their civilization. But it's not just their penchant for deadly weapon supplies that makes them a valuable asset on the battlefield. Master Engineers that grow wary of the quiet life step into combat with their firearm expertise and utilize their patriotic nature to achieve victory. This new generic lord for the Empire may approach battle on foot or mount on top of Warhorse, Mechanical Steed, or even a Steam Tank. Yes! <laughs> Bring on the Steam Tank. That's amazing. Wielding a grenade launcher, yep, as their primary weapon and a sword as a backup, the Master Engineer brings some experimental devices to the table as they lead their armies directly. With the Master of Ballistics, this passive ability grants reduced reload time for artillery war machines while also increasing their accuracy. And they have the pigeon bombs! Yes, the pigeon bombs. Um, thanks to their pigeon bombs and active ability, the Master Engineer can deliver a single long-range bombardment of destruction. Learn from the best. So a couple of interesting things about this guy. A, the fact that he can ride a steam tank is amazing. Uh, so we have officially steam tank mounts in Total War Warhammer, which is absolutely fantastic. The mechanical Steve, which we can see how down here, is so <laughs> stupid, but wonderful. Like, the Empire is getting so many stupid units, but, like, they're the delightful kind of stupid. They're the kind of stupid that I think enhances the setting by just pointing out how ridiculous it is as opposed to, like, a bad kind of stupid. So I'm so happy the Mechanical Steed is in the game. But he also gets the Pigeon Bombs. So for those unaware, the Pigeon Bombs are much less fancy sounding than <laughs> what they actually are. So the way the Pigeon Bomb works um, from the lore is that they literally trained homing pigeons to like go towards the enemy 
And what they would do is they would quite literally strap some really high yield explosives around a pigeon's neck and then just throw it in the air. <laughs> just good luck. Uh, and it, if you were lucky on tabletop, you'd get, if it, you were lucky, it would go towards the target, hit them and blow up. But the vast majority of the time, it was not going to do that. Uh, it was going to go some other random direction. It might, it, it even had like goofy misfire rules where your guy might throw it and the pigeon like gets confused and comes back to the guy that threw it. So it blows up on him. Uh, so it was a goofy ass weapon, but very iconic. So I'm really glad to see it's made into the game. I, I suspect the Total War version is going to be much more reliable Though I do hope it has an absolutely absurd animation. I want to see exploding pigeons. Uh, I want to see deadly, deadly pigeons. The generic engineer. It's also interesting to see that he has a grenade launcher. Because if you go back and watch the Thrones of Decay trailer, obviously he's using kind of like the Huckland long rifle. Um, but I think the grenade launcher is going to be much better. Uh, because the grenade launcher is going to make it where like he's firing blasts that are able to impact large groups of enemies. Um, or like bunched up bows and stuff, which is going to make him a much more useful and B, I think help him stand out much more against like the huntsman general, because the huntsman general is like your big single target. He shoots a bow from a really long distance and he's got really good anti-large and he's capable of like sniping monsters. Whereas this guy has a grenade launcher, which is going to be much better for getting like to medium to short range and like blowing up groups of infantry and cavalry and stuff like that. So I, th I think this is a much better decision. The engineer. The engineers of the Empire follow a life similar to that of their masters, though instead of leading troops into battle, they opt to nestle themselves within it as a supporting generic hero. Wielding the same gizmos and gadgets as those that trained them, the engineers leave the grenade launchers at home in favor of a two-handed repeater rifle with the option of a warhorse or mechanical steed. With this, they have access to artillery buffs with the master of ballistics and a potent mercurial shot from their rifles. With Mercurial Shot, an active magic missile for the uh, engineer, they fire a powerful flaming projectile from afar with high target penetration and an explosive payload. So, awesome. Uh, I love his crazy little mustache. It looks delightful. And I love the, the mechanical steel. looks so stupid, but I love it. I love it so much. So, really happy this thing made it into the game. I uh, love that he's got a repeater rifle, so he's going to be able to shoot, like, pop, 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 pop shots, which is going to look really nice. So, he's kind of like you know, kind of like an outrider, but uh, he'll have, be able to have it on foot as well, which is nice. So focusing more on a burst of shots as opposed to just like a single, like one single big shot, uh, etc. But this gives the Empire a nice um, uh, ranged hero option. The known iron sides. Drawn from the guards and apprentices of the Imperial Gunnery School, the known iron sides belonging to the iron companies of known, rocking heavy plate armor and black powder firearms. Some of the most widely respected combatants the Empire has to offer, and with the advanced equipment to match, the Nuln Ironsides are a new missile infantry type that the enemy will wish they'd kept their distance from. With access to a two-handed rifle, is is there such thing as a one-handed rifle? <laughs> what, what is a two-handed rifle versus a one-handed... Well, okay, whatever. Um, and a sword is a backup. The Nuln Ironsides are best suited alongside their fellow handgunners, launching a barrage of lead across the lanes to support their front lines. They have access to a new passive ability called Black Powder Discipline, which gives the known Ironsides a big boost to their accuracy and reload speed when they're firing from a stationary position. Awesome, awesome. So they are able to fire quickly and accurately. Uh, some of you may have spotted the Ironsides with non-regulation repeater handguns in our Thrones of Decay announced trailer. This footage was captured on an in-development version of the game. However, in order to remain as authentic to the world of Warhammer as possible, the known Ironsides at release will be issued with Master Rot handguns, plate armor, and highly drilled firing discipline. Okay, so <clears throat> in the trailer, yeah, they do have the repeater rifles like the engineer does. So it looks like they changed it to make them more accurate to their tabletop and their lore representation. Uh, I mean, I think the repeaters were a cool idea. Um, hopefully, I'm going to be curious. I feel like the repeaters have a very easy job of being like, okay, your handgunners are like, pew, reload, pew, reload. Um, whereas these, you know, whereas with the repeater would have been pop, 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 reload. So I'm curious how they're going to make the handguns for the known iron sights feel significantly more powerful than the regular handgunners. Like if, uh, just like how much faster is their reload rate going to be? Do they get like two shots per volley or just one still? 
Um, like how much faster is their reload rate going to be? How much more accurate are they going to be? Uh, they're going to have to have some pretty substantial buffs. Um, though, obviously they're going to have the huge defensive buffs, uh, from wearing plate armor and probably much higher melee attack, melee defense, armor, uh, and leadership. But, uh, it'll be interesting to see if they can make their shooting feel very different. Hawkland long rifles. The Empire doubles down on their black powder utilization with the Hawklanders and their rifled firearm crafted by Leon Toddmeister himself. This precise Hawkland long rifle, or to give its full title, uh, Leon Toddmeister's fantabulously far-reaching harquebus of unforeseeable and unperceived bereavement is widely hated by those that haven't had the privilege to use it. Able to single out generals and commanders from far away, no one on the wrong end of this barrel is truly safe, and with a sword in the back pocket of its users, this low-entity missile infantry finds its place amongst the Empire's growing taste for firearms. So, I love these guns. They look awesome. They've got the sniper scopes on them, and uh, it, it's interesting that they're low-entity, so they're clearly meant to kind of mirror the crane gunners, crane gunners and the uh, warplock disails, but they're single guys. So, they're, they're not a weapon team, which means they're probably going to be much, much easier to maneuver. Also, I love their ridiculous floppy hats. They look fantastic. And uh, I'm going to be really, really interested to see how like their range and damage and stuff is going to compare versus their fellow snipers. Because all the snipers we've gotten so far when it comes to long range guns are weapon teams, whereas these guys are not. So they're, they're kind of an interesting classification. So it'll be very, very interesting to see how they perform. And then the Knights of the Black Rose. Oh, they're so pretty. I love their helmets. They got the skull helms. The skull helms are so sick. Founded during the darkest days of the Black Plague, the Order of the Black Rose was always shrouded in mystery, though its size has shifted unreliably over time. With dark silver armor to reference their name and red gauntlets to signify the spilt blood of their enemies, the Knights of the Black Rose, a new cavalry unit, frequent the symbols of the gods of death and are only chosen from those of highest nobility. As a heavily armored cavalry unit, the Knights of the Black Rose ride atop war horses, they storm into battle. Equipped with sword and shield, they excel at prolonged combat without the need to cycle in and out helping them lock down the enemy as their fellow cavalry push him from the flank and bind the opposition where they stand, assuming they don't send them flying. So uh, they look beautiful, and this will be a really nice addition for the Empire, getting some just sword and board cavalry who are just designed to sit in combat. Uh, because all of the other cavalry, most, the vast majority of the Empire cavalry is, um, uh, the vast majority is shot cavalry. So your demigriffs are shot cav, where like they rely very heavily on that charge bonus and doing high bursts of damage to really get the job done. Because if they're just sitting in combat, they're just going to take a lot of damage. Uh, even like the only the only decent like non shock cavalry the Empire has is probably the um, um, the Knights of the Bull. Um, not as like Knights of the Stubborn Bull or whatever it is, which is the knightly order of Osland, I believe, which is an electric count unit you can get from Osland, uh, where they've got like the big two handed swords. So, uh, the Knights of the Black Rose, I think are going to be awesome and will fulfill a very nice niche of being able to just get into combat and just kind of hold in place. Um, I will say they were not, a, they were not a unit I expected. I was really, really, uh, for new Knights, I would have sworn we would have been getting Knights Panther or Knights of the White Wolf. Um, next, not Knights of the Black Rose, but I do think they fulfill a really, really nice job. I still think there is a really solid niche, uh, in the future for the Knights Panther and Knights of the White Wolf with the Knights of the White Wolf, of course, bringing like the big two handed cavalry hammers and the Knights Panther, uh, hopefully being able to have like a super big focus into killing, uh, monsters as like a mid tier heavy cav unit instead of having to go like all the way up to your Demigris with halberds. But, uh, yeah. They look super dupe. They look really good. They're very pretty. And I think they're going to perform a nice role. The Steam Tank with Volley Gun. God, look how pretty the Steam Tank is now. They pop the hood. You can see that's where the Master Engineer is going to go. But it's like they pop the hood. You got the little, you got the little uh, Engineer Commander guy sticking out. And it's so pretty and shiny now. Look how good it looks. Let's see. The first steam tank ever designed came to the mind of a Tulane inventor, Leonardo de Maragliano, and used dwarf technology to power its many gears and pistons. They became an empire staple despite a design so complex that future empire generations have been unable to produce any more of them. But now a new variant has arrived on the field, completely rebuilt, remodeled, and redesigned, bringing with it a unique tool of destruction. 
So the typical steam tank brings a whole mounted cannonball launcher as part of the package. The volley gun variant has swapped that weapon out for a new revolving triple barreled cannon. This change in weaponry sacrifices the longer range of the steam cannon for a much higher rate of fire, making it ideal for getting to the thick of battle and mowing targets down with its spitting barrels. Steam tanks as a whole have also seen an upgrade with several new attributes and behaviors that will impact both variants. The steam tank now has a directional shield, which allows it to block projectiles from all sides. But crucially, the missile block chance is most effective when the steam tank is hit by a projectile at its front. That's awesome. So steam tanks are going to be much, much less vulnerable to small arms fire or just range fire in general, which is great. They've also opened the hatch on top and an engineer commander sits proudly in the turret, waving his sword about and shooting anyone who gets too close. Finally, the steam tank could fire all its weapons whilst on the move, making it much easier to use in battle. So they have fire whilst moving, which is kick ass. And they also have everyone's favorite meme for anything involving a tank, which is the classic drive me closer <laughs> so I can hit them with my sword. Drive closer, lads. The Marienburg land ship, the dumbest thing ever put in the Warhammer Fantasy, but my God, is it fun. Set sail in the face of adversity with the Marienburg Landship, a colossal bulky contraption originally designed for the merchant lords of Marienburg in an attempt to imitate the Empire's strongest steam tanks. What this new war machine lacks in sophistication, it makes up for in sheer size, ambition, and its myriad of weaponry. Towering over the battlefield is a mobile fo fortress of sorts. Gosh, my tongue. The Marienburg Landship launches light cannon rounds from its uh, culverin and can crush opponents underfoot whilst the crew rem remain on the deck above armed with rifles to pick off any passers-by with the active toggle ability full power the marienburg cranks itself up to full speed sacrificing its turning capabilities in favor of ramming speed if things aboard the vessel are getting dire the passive ability abandoned ship will trigger detonating the land ship and killing everyone nearby but with the might of this hulking war machine the enemies will be the ones thrown overboard so that's hilarious and magical. Um, it, it does very much kind of feel like the Thunder Barge on foot, essentially, like the Thunder Barge on the ground, where it's, you know, it's a big, uh, essentially weapons platform that while it has a front mounted like little cannon, it's mostly, I think, about all the guys along the top who have the rifles and are constantly shooting down at a 360, which is going to give it really, really good passive damage as it's just mowing through the battlefield. But it also sounds like it kind of has a little bit of the Chaos Dwarf uh, trains, um, the like the Iron Demon and the Skullcracker in it, where it's got the, the full power ahead, and it's going to probably be able to do a pretty hefty amount of damage to infantry blocks by just plowing through them and using that hefty mass to really enhance its charge bonus, all the while just shooting at everyone around it. So uh, I love it. It's dumb. The fact that it blows up when it dies is hilarious, though it also gives it a really funny, like, thematic tie-in with Theodore Bruckner, where they're kind of like, ha like, you killed me, but now I'm going to kill everything around me. So, excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, it looks goofy as hell, which is what it should look like. Uh, I love it. All right, let's get into Empire Legacy updates. So, what do we have coming to the Empire with 5.0? The Elector Counts in Imperial Authority. So. What were the issues with the old system? Uh, so it worked okay for Karl Franz back in Warhammer 2, but in Warhammer 3, it's pretty terrible because there's just way too many enemies in the Empire now. Uh, there's also uh, a lot of just random problems with the Electric Counts mechanic, and Imperial Authority is just kind of a mess. So how are they changing it? Uh, Imperial Authority has been completely reworked and now has nothing to do with the Electric Count system. Cool. While the Electric Count system is often not appropriate for the other our other Empire Lords as they aren't electors, we felt like Imperial Authority should be for all of them. Very cool. All Empire factions now have access to Imperial Authority. However, it only becomes active if you have territory within the Empire. I really, really like that. So they're introducing a mechanic that only activates once you are in the Empire. So if you're playing as Marcus Wolfhart or Volkmar the Grimm and you're just busy off in Hecara or Lestria, obviously you're too far away to worry about the Empire's problems. You got your own shit to deal with. So you will not have to worry about Imperial Authority and don't have to worry about like, oh, the Empire's on fire because you got bigger problems. However, should you go home 
and take some empire territory, either through just walking home or confederating, the moment you take some territory uh, in the empire, boom, you've got imperial authority as a mechanic, it's active, and you got stuff to do. The Electric Count's mechanic is now purely exclusive to Karl Franz, but don't worry, Gelt is getting a overhaul. Nice. Uh, that makes sense. The, the only characters that should have access to Electric Counts should be Electric Counts. Uh, though, funny enough, technically, <laughs> technically, Volkmar the Grim is an Electric Count. Uh, he does have he does have electoral votes. Funny enough, uh, but a lot of people don't really. You know, most people are kind of like, ah, that's a technicality. But like, te technically, he has he has votes, um, so he he would count. <laughs> but I don't think that's what they mean by electric count. So it's fine. Um, but uh, that's really really awesome. The only characters I want to see with access to the electric count system are Carl Franz, Boris Toddbringer when he becomes playable one day, uh, and then Vlad and Isabella von Karstein, whichever one of them you end up playing. Um, those are the characters that should be electric counts because I really, really hope Vlad gets access to that mechanic. Um, cause that would help him just feel like a fully fleshed out character. Cause it's like where Manfred is a von Karstein character. He also has the books of Nagash, which give him his very own fun gimmick and stuff. Whereas, uh, Vlad's just kind of there. Um, like he's great and he's got Isabella, which is great, but I would really love for them to get a vampire version on that mechanic. All right. So then we have. Uh, Imperial Authority, which would previously impact Fealty via chance. Uh, Fealty instead now simply goes down and up directly via cause and effect. So players will be able to more directly see the effects of their or others' decisions and actions across the Empire. Okay, so Imperial Authority is no longer tied to Fealty. Uh, at a base level, Imperial Authority shows how much of the Empire is actually controlled by the Empire, and it will divvy out rewards accordingly, whilst giving you a clear view of how well the Empire Man is doing as a whole. Okay, so that's good. Uh, I think simpler is better in this case. And it sound okay. So it kind of sounds like the empire is going to be, or the Imperial authority is going to be very similar to a the ever Queens mechanic where her mechanic is the more of Ulthuan that's owned by high elves, the better goodies you get. This sounds like pretty much the same thing where the more of the empire that's owned by empire guys, the better the goodies are. So that's great. Uh, some tweaks and improvements have been made to the electric council UI to tidy up. Cool. Uh, and have summoned the Elector Counts, uh, visible at all times. Uh, new markers have been added to Empire Regions to show who their rightful owner should be. Nice. Um, summon the Elector Counts. Functionality has changed. Originally, it replenished all the Elector Count state troops. Now, when the Elector Counts are summoned, every Elector Count that is not currently garrisoned or besieged will be summoned to Karl Franz? <laughs> That's so cool. So when you summon the Elector Counts, all of the Elector Counts will gather to Karl Franz and be like, For the Emperor! That's, that's great. That's great. With these changes and by allowing every Empire faction access to Imperial Authority, we're reinforcing the idea that every leader is motivated by the protection of the Empire, even if some are preoccupied in other places. Cool. Karl Franz. Uh, Karl Franz Holschwig, uh, Lieb, whatever. He's got, he's a, his full name is very long. Uh, Karl Franz is almost more like his first name. <laughs> Holschwig Schlichstein, I think. Uh, Karl Franz hosts a beloved, ca beloved campaign that many players enjoy, so it was important for us to maintain everything you enjoy while just making it better. What were his problems? His start position was kind of a bitch, especially with Helmgart. Uh, Helmgart being the really big fortress that the rebels would start in control of. Uh, electoral machinations were also pretty goddamn useless. Uh, when the electric counts and imperial authority requires you to defend the empire, he doesn't have many tools to do that, which is kind of annoying. Uh, so yeah, he's just kind of a mess. So what are they changing? Karl Franz now begins his campaign with control over Helmgard. So you no longer have to force the rebels out of the fortress. Instead, you have a big bottleneck fortress that's keeping the rebels there and allowing you to focus on beating the shit out of the secessionists and uh, crushing them under your heel, which is great, which is going to make your early campaign much, much easier. We've also added a bunch of new tools to Karl Franz within his electoral machinations panel called the Emperor's Decrees. Each decree is a powerful ability that can benefit either your own or fellow empire factions at the cost of prestige. As an example, you can trigger an inquisition. No one expects the Karl Franz inquisition in a province to clear away some corruption, send aid to an elector that increases their fealty and spawns a temporary army to help protect them or safely declaring war against another elector count without suffering uh, fealty losses through the Casus Belli, which is probably Latin for something that I don't know. 
So that's great. So now they have a way where if there's an electric count who's just being a pain in your ass, <coughs> Boris, uh, you can just turn around and just punch them into the dirt uh, using a special thing where you're like, ah, that man's a heretic. That man is clearly not doing what he's supposed to. Karl Franz also has a trait where he's immune, a faction trait, where he's immune to all trespass penalties when moving through the empire. Of course, it's his empire. Uh, this is also really good because it means Karl Franz can ride to the aid of other electoral uh, of provinces without just like pissing them off, which was super dumb. Um, you know, if Mint if Hawkland is getting overwhelmed by Festus and Franz rides to their aid, it shouldn't result in Talibekland, uh, Midland, and Hawkland all being like, ah, fuck, what the hell, mate? How dare you trespass? How dare you trespass? All right. Balthazar Gelt. Oh, baby. Oh, baby boy. Everybody's favorite, uh, <laughs> everybody's favorite boy. Loves waking up to the smell of gold magic in the morning. What are the issues with Gelt? He didn't have a mechanic, and he was boring. Uh, and Elspeth is going to be starting in Nuln. Therefore, he doesn't need to be there anymore. Cool. Awesome. So, what are we changing? Balthazar Gelt has taken an educational exchange trip to Grand Cathay, starting just shy of some nomads uh, within the Temple of Elemental Winds and being right next door to his good friend, the Iron Dragon. As he helps the Iron Dragon deal with the nomads, he is presented with a series of dilemmas that pave the way for his time in Cathay, or even his return to the Empire, having secured a lifelong friendship in the process. You heard it here, <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Zhao Ming and Balthazar Gelt uh, Yaoi is, is canon now. <laughs> Get on it, artist. <laughs> uh, Christ. Uh, what's, all, what's all this about a new campaign mechanic? Gelt has a new campaign feature, the Colleges of Magic. Fuck yeah. With this mechanic, which whenever Gelt fights a battle with a wizard in his army, he will require arcane essays with the number of arcane essays per battle correlating with the number of wizards. These arcane essays can be spent on gaining instant access to wizards from every lore of magic, allowing him to accrue spellcasters quicker and easier than any other campaign. Once you've acquired a new wizard, let's say the gold wizard, more actions are unlocked for that college pertaining to that specific spellcaster. Firstly, arcane essays uh, can be spent to unlock cataclysm spells? Oh, that's so cool! Oh, that's so cool! You're going to be able to get cataclysm spells? Uh, however, you know, that's not all with the Grey College. Uh, you can gain a unique effect in this instance called Mass Concealment. This can be used with essays to grant the Stalking Stance to an army containing a Grey Wizard, granting them a 100% ambush success chance. Oh my god. Okay, so that means every single college gets a unique effect, like in this case Mass Concealment, they get access to whatever their Lore of Magic's uh, Cataclysm spell is, in addition to some other bonus. Um, for, for instance, maybe you want to heal your entire army immediately. We'll recruit a Jade Wizard and you can do just that. That's fucking awesome. Oh my god, I'm so excited for Gelt. I'm so excited for Gelt! Uh, these changes and additions are designed to uh, uh, revitalize the Empire across the board and make their new arrival, Elspeth Von Draken, feel right at home. Whether you're summoning the electric counts as Karl Franz, polishing up in the arcane with Balthazar Gelt, or educating the masses with the Imperial Gunnery School, there's plenty to sink your teeth into. Fan-fucking-tastic. For more details on Elspeth von Dragon to watch her in action, keep an eye for, you know, the coming days. And then next week, we'll be going to talk about Malachi Makasin. And then the following week after that will be our FLC blog post and FAQ to answer any remaining questions. Well, this looks fucking amazing. Um, I don't really have anything to add that I think I didn't cover in the video. Um, I think I'm most, funny enough, I like, don't get me wrong, I'm excited for the DLC, but I'm really excited for Balthazar Gelt now. Um, like, oh my lord, uh, I am very excited for Balthazar Gelt. So, uh, please let me know down below, uh, what you guys are the most excited about. Uh, this is gonna be a big week, um, so there's, there's gonna be tons and tons of stuff happening. I hope that you'll all be joining me. Uh, here on the YouTube channel and over around on Twitch and everything uh, to cover like all the crazy amazing new stuff that's coming to the game and uh, yeah please take care very exciting times and I'll see you very soon